freedom to move into the new. Aren't you glad? And he taught them that new cloth needs to be placed on new cloth. And the new wine needs to be put in new wine skins. Now at the end of chapter 2, we find him on the Sabbath walking through a grain field with his disciples. And his disciples are hungry. And they start pinching off the ripe tops of the grain and eating them. And immediately the Pharisees jump on this because according to their interpretation, Jesus' disciples were breaking the Sabbath. So Jesus reminds them of the story of King David breaking the Sabbath law to care for others. God gave them laws about the Sabbath to keep it reverent. And Jesus ends his teaching by saying, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he's proclaiming his authority to reinterpret the Mosaic Law. Then chapter 3 begins. And it begins with Jesus once again in the synagogue for worship. There's a man there and he's got a shriveled hand. And the Greek is really weird here. And it would seem that this, the word that's used for shrivel means that he had been in an accident. And he had lost the ability to use that hand. Also, in the synagogue that day was a contingent of scribes. Scribes are people that interpret the law who had come all the way from Jerusalem and it was a long way in those days to see what this Jesus character was doing. And they're there in the synagogue and they're watching closely. You see, they honestly did not believe anything or anyone could, should, or would reinterpret the Scripture. They also totally believed that no one could break one of the Old Testament laws and be a person of God, much less a teacher or a spiritual leader. That's why they watched Jesus so closely. If anyone proclaimed to be God, it was blasphemy, which for the Jewish nation was punishable by stoning. Now they got some intent going on here watching Jesus. Anyway, they're in the synagogue, and there's this pitiful man who has this physical ailment which will segregate him and probably keep him from working. And in that day and age, if you didn't work, guess what? It meant you starved or you begged. Jesus calls the man forward. I love that. Jesus calls the man forward. In this way, everything he did was above board. And maybe it makes me wonder by calling this guy forward if he wasn't hoping to prompt some compassion out of these folks who were church leaders. Jesus is standing by the man, and he simply asked them, Mark 3, verse 4, which is lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill. But they said nothing to answer him. Jesus, who is the lover of every single person, who is the includer of every single person, is deeply distressed by their hard-heartedness. He even gets angry. The word there for distressed, I don't know what version you're looking at, but it, it means a deep anger by their stubborn and calloused attitudes. Their interpretation of religious rules was more important to them than a person's need. You want to know what makes Jesus mad? Right there it is. Jesus then heals the man and his life is restored. 
And those church leaders from Jerusalem begin to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The very question he asked them, do evil, do good. Give life, kill. And what do they do? They walk out of the, the, the church, the synagogue, plotting and go to plot to kill this guy. Jesus, too, leaves the synagogue, and again, he's surrounded by the crowds from all over the region, Jews and Gentiles alike. He continues to display his authority over the physical world by healings and the spiritual world by exorcisms. Mark keeps the narrative moving like a speeding bullet, and he takes us directly to a mountain where Jesus calls the 12 disciples, and he gives them power to preach, and the power over demons. After all this activity, it makes me breathless just to read it. After all this activity, he goes home. And that would bring us to our scripture for today. Would you stand? Mark 3, beginning with verse 20. I got a new Bible handed to me this morning that I would like to use. Thank you, Rick. The scurvy mob were a-gathering once more, so there weren't even a morsel of bread to eat. When his mates heard tell of it, they set sail, apprehending him, for he proclaimed, he's gone stark raving mad. Just kidding. The pirate version of the Bible. <laughs> I love the word, the word and I have an incredible respect for the word, but I just couldn't resist sharing that with you. The scurvy mob. This morning I will be reading from Mark chapter 3 beginning with verse 20 and I'll be using the New Century version. Then Jesus went home. But again, a crowd gathered. There were so many people that Jesus and his followers could not eat. When his family heard this, they went to get him because they thought he was out of his mind. But the teachers of the law from Jerusalem were saying, Beelzebul is living inside of him. He uses power from the ruler of demons to force demons out of people. So Jesus called the people together and taught them with stories. He said, Satan will not force himself out of people. A kingdom that is divided cannot continue. And a family that is divided cannot continue. And if Satan is against himself and fights against his own people, he cannot continue. That is the end of Satan. Verse 27. No one can enter a strong person's house and steal his things unless he first ties up the strong person. Then he can steal things from the house. I tell you the truth. All sins that people do and all the things people say against God can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of a sin that continues forever. Jesus said this because the teachers of the law said that he had an evil spirit inside him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be, be, be seated. Verse 20. Then Jesus went home. But again a crowd gathered. There were so many people that Jesus and his followers could not eat. When it says Jesus went home, more than likely it's talking about a house in Capernaum. That was his home base at this point. I would guess Jesus is wanting some R&R. &R. Maybe he would like to do some small group interchange. I mean, he just chose his 12. But the crowds gather. They're outside the house and they're inside the house. They're at the windows, the doors, and even the cracks in the walls. The place is crawling. I wonder if Jesus sighed. I mean, the disciples needed teaching. 
and the close followers needed encouraging. And they all needed rest. But the multitude also needed healing and freedom and acceptance and a million other things. So around the house that day, it is bedlam. Chaos, pushing, sweating, talking, body odor, sick people coughing. Think about it. Shoulder to shoulder people, all the introverts in the room just shuddered. And by the way, remember in those days they didn't bathe very often. It is so bad inside the house that they cannot get a meal on the table, much less eat it. When you have the chance to eat in Jesus' day and you can't, something is terribly wrong. You're either sick, dying, or out of your mind. Verse 21. When his family heard this, they went to get him because they thought he was out of his mind. I don't know which family members initially went to get Jesus, but the language here designates it was his blood relatives. I think it would be wisdom for us to step into their shoes for just a minute. If you have a sibling, a parent, or a child, and they leave the family business, to become a homeless, penniless, traveling preacher, you might think they had lost it. When their ministry draws big crowds of people that are considered low class and the dregs of society, you might think they had gone bonkers. If your child, parent, or family mem member begin to live with and teach a band of people that consist of a tax collector, which would have been considered a national traitor, and guerrilla fighter extremist, women of low repute, fishermen, and other no names, it might worry you. Think about your child. I think about my children, they've all gone there. Now, consider this. What if your family had always been part of the church? You've done everything you can to raise your children right. I mean, your religion is not just your belief system, it's also your ethnicity. It surrounds your life. And the respected church leaders are saying your family member is teaching something that's evil and wrong. Your family member is a heretic. Because we know it's Jesus, I think inside of us we forget how hard this would have been. They are saying, the whole church council is saying that your child is breaking God's word. And not only that, but he is blaspheming God, which brings a death sentence. I believe that any of us might want to go and rescue our loved one and take them home. In this passage, Jesus' ministry would seem so out of control that they aren't even eating or resting or taking care of themselves at all. Interestingly, Mark doesn't resolve what happens with the family next. He goes to a whole other story and leaves us hanging. He jumps back to the scribes from Jerusalem. And those scribes now are exclaiming and proclaiming 
to anyone who will listen that the reason Jesus can do the miracles he can do is because the prince of demons is living in him and giving him power. Verse 22. But the teachers of the law from Jerusalem were saying, Beelzebul is living inside of him. He uses power from the ruler of demons to force demons out of people. Remember, these are the teachers of the law. These are the people who have been the trusted interpreters of Scripture. And they say Jesus is full of Satan. It's interesting to me that these folks were more willing to believe in black magic than consider something new with God might be happening. They were really afraid of anything new. As a matter of fact, I believe at this point they've already made up their minds that Jesus is not the Messiah. And I'm convinced the religious leaders honestly believe that Jesus is an imposter. So Jesus then gathers the people. Now this is a big crowd, and when it says he gathers the people, it means that he's gathering everyone, including his close disciples, and he's gathering the folks in the house, and he's gathering the folks outside the house, and the religious leaders. And what he does is he begins to tell stories. Verse 23, So Jesus called the people together and taught them with stories, and he said, Satan will not force himself out of people. A kingdom that is divided cannot continue, and a family that is divided cannot continue. And if Satan is against himself and fights against his own people, he cannot continue. That's the end of Satan. So Jesus just uses a really simple, logical process to disprove their statements. Satan will not go to war with himself, duh. A kingdom or a family that is divided will not continue. If Satan fights with his own demons, his kingdom is weakened and will fall. I mean, it's just common sense answers. Don't you just love it when it's common sense stuff? But then Jesus, as he often does, adds a whole nother story. And it's not about Satan's kingdom being divided and falling. It's about Satan being completely defeated. Verse 27. No one can enter a strong person's house and steal his things unless he first ties up the strong person. Then he can steal things from the house. Have you noticed all through Mark, Jesus has been tying up Satan and freeing people? I mean, he's been healing. He's been driving out demons. He's been including many who were deemed hopeless. He's been teaching. He's been calling. He's been giving people new identities and new lives. He's been forgiving sins. He's been washing away guilt and shame. He's been binding up Satan and releasing sin-saturated prisoners right and left. That's some pretty good news. Satan is and forever will be defeated by Jesus Christ. We have to understand that because the world is hard and the world is bad and we can get to thinking Jesus is out of control. Something's out of control. Let me say this again. Satan was, is, and forever will be defeated by Jesus Christ. At... This point, Jesus in this text says some things that we must keep in this setting and attempt to interpret properly. Can can I use the word never? You know, we all say never say never. But can I use the word never here? Never should this particular phrase be taken out of context. Verse 28. I tell you the truth, all sins that people do 
and all the things people say against God can be forgiven. Isn't that good news? But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of a sin that continues forever. This must be kept in context. These religious leaders, mind you, who knew the Scripture, the Old Testament, to be in the position they were in, they had to memorize the whole Old Testament. And then the whole what's called the Talmud. They knew everything that a person could know about the Scripture. We have to remember that. These were the supposed spiritual leaders of the people. And they had become so sure of themselves, what they had been taught, that they could not hear, see, or feel the truth about Jesus. I mean, Jesus just healed a man with a withered hand. They were there, probably on the front row. Because of their position in the synagogue, they would have been seated at the front. And they are attributing the ministry of Jesus as doing something from Satan. They are denying his sonship to God. They are denying his messiahship. And they are condemning his ministry on earth. The sin here is when a person's heart is hardened to the point they cannot feel, hear, or understand the truth of who Jesus is. And they are so inflexible in thinking Jesus as being nothing, they will not seek him or believe in him. What this unforgivable sin is not some behavior. It's not because you say the wrong thing. It's not because you stub your toe and something comes out you're ashamed of. That's not it. Sometimes people worry, and I've had so many people say, boy, I hope I've never committed the unpardonable sin. Let me tell you, if you're thinking about that, you haven't. <laughs> if that's even on your radar. Because that's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not what's happening in this place in the Scripture. Brothers and sisters, until our last breath, the Holy Spirit draws us and the forgiving God and lover of our soul has his arms out. What Jesus is talking about here Mark even clarifies a second time. Verse 30 Jesus said this because the teachers of the law said he had an evil spirit inside him. Mark is clarifying here that Jesus makes this statement because they think Satan is his leader, is his boss, is how he's doing everything he's doing. Because they have already decided Jesus isn't real. Jesus doesn't exist. He is nothing. The Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son are one. They cannot be and are not in league with the devil. A person who believes Jesus is evil can never see him as Savior and Redeemer. Therefore, they never ask for forgiveness. This unpardonable sin is not believing who Jesus says he is. You realize Jesus is not condemning the scribes here, don't you, also? You ever thought about that? He just wouldn't have said anything if they were already condemned. He tells them this because he's... I believe he was praying and hoping and wooing and drawing, attempting to get them to see the truth. I can't be Satan. If Satan were in me, he'd be fighting against himself. Don't go here. 
don't go here. Jesus was trying to get them to listen, to hear, to feel, to see that he really is God's beloved son, savior, redeemer, friend, king, lord. Jesus loved these very people who were blaspheming him. You realize that's what they were doing. That's love, to look at an enemy and love them so much that you speak truth hoping they will receive it. Now, technically, that ends our scripture text for today. That's verse 30. But i got to know what happens with the family. Don't you want to know what the, happened with the family? Mark goes... From this exchange, he sandwiches this exchange about Beelzebub and the devil being Jesus and la, 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 in between what happened with Jesus' family. Isn't that interesting? I don't think that's a mistake. Mark goes from this exchange of who Jesus is, the authority that he has, and his messiahship to his family being outside the door. With the news of their arrival, he takes the opportunity to teach everyone there something new, a new concept. New cloth on new cloth, new wine in new wine skins. He breaks the understanding of his day. And maybe it's an understanding we need to consider in our day. He breaks the understanding that blood family was more important than God's family. Because in his day it was. I'm not sure in our day it's still not. Sometimes family takes precedence over God. And when that happens, we're out of scriptural teaching. We don't like that. I don't like that. So what Jesus does is he tells the people around him who remember Right here sitting in front of Jesus, probably at his feet, are the 12 people that he has just called to be his representatives on earth, plus other people who will follow him through the very end to Pentecost and then go out into the world with the gospel. That's who's sitting right here. And what he does is he tells them that God's family is bonded together in a way that even a blood family can't compare with. Because it's forever and always. Because it's the Holy Spirit linking them together. Now, understand Jesus is not being disrespectful to his family. Jesus loves and cares for his family. And we know that his family at some point, and we don't know when, but we do know at some point his family got incredibly involved with Jesus and the gospel because we have the book of James and we have the book of Jude who are both, by tradition and really good tradition, were Jesus' kinfolk. So we know at some point that his family came to believe but at this point, they are freaking out because Jesus has gone nuts. Or so they think. I mean, he's not even eating. He's not resting. He's not taking care of himself. He's surrounded by all these people who are undesirables and who are the worst people around. And he's going totally against the church. Jesus addresses the fact that those who believe in him are closer than blood kin. And that Jesus himself 
will be loyal to those who are his spiritual family, as loyal to them as we would be to our parents, our children, our siblings, our closest family members. Closer than a brother. Verse 33, Jesus asked, Who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those sitting around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. My true brother and sister and mother are those who do what God wants. Boy, I told you when we started Mark, because I've preached from Mark several times, I had already preached all the fun stories. And that all that was left in Mark that I hadn't preached in this church are the hard stories. I wasn't kidding. This is a hard story. It's a hard story to understand that people did and sometimes even now believe that Jesus is evil or doesn't exist at all and they don't let their heart hear, see, feel anything. And that's very dangerous. That's a hard teaching. And it's a hard teaching to know that Jesus family is stronger than blood. Doesn't mean we don't care for our blood kin, la la la. Jesus is full of compassion. That's not what he's saying here. But he's saying understand that the spiritual family is first. And then we plant our families and we give our families and we run our families and we do with our families under Christ who is our head our father you ever wonder why they chose father to call God it says here my true brother and sister and mother are those who do what God wants and what does God want I think we see some of it in this little passage of Scripture that's not my most favorite, for sure. He wants us to believe that Jesus is his Son, our Savior, our brother, our friend, our Redeemer. He wants us to seek his forgiveness and new life, new cloth on new cloth, new wine in new wineskins every day, not just a one-time thing. He wants us to be like He is. He wants His Holy Spirit to flow in us and through us and out of us. Loving, caring, forgiving, understanding, seeking wholeness, closeness with all others, all the things we've been seeing Jesus do in the book of Mark. It's good news. The gospel according to Mark. 